Spending two days going through a systematic process to plan in your business is going to be one of the most valuable things that you can possibly do in your business. Hello and welcome back Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today I'm joined by Business of Architecture Principal Ryan Willard. Ryan, welcome. Thank you very much Enix. Pleasure to be here as always. So today we're going to talk about something that is sort of a, a deadly cancer in the architecture industry, which is this idea of overwhelm, but more specifically, time, what we call time scarcity, time scarcity. So the feeling that time is a scarce resource, which indeed time is a limited resource. There are bounds on our time, uh, but how we approach it and the stories we have around it then begins to inform some things. So today on today's episode, you'll discover a powerful framework for being able to triple or even quadruple or 10x your effectiveness without having to do more architecture, without having to do crazy time blocking, or without having to carry around a Franklin Day planner or the, the electronic equivalent of that. We're going to get to the core of the matter here of what people generally call time management, which is actually a myth, the idea of time management. There's no such thing as time management, right, Ryan? Absolutely. Why is there no such thing as time management? We're not really managing time. That's right. It's, it's ourselves that we need to manage. Time exactly. management. Exactly. Time management is really self leadership. It's, it's self leadership, and if we are managing anything, it's our energy. Beautiful. Very well said. Well said. Now, to put the context for this episode, we're going to share something that just happened. We're, we're just turning into the new year here, here at Business of Architecture. And one of the powerful parts of smart practice is, um, is planning and tracking uh, your business. So this is a part of the program where architects learn the skill set of planning and tracking in their business to be able to achieve 10x results. Um, this year, like us personally, I usually spend... In the past, I spent two days every single month planning, updating my plans, my goals, my chart, like everything, just kind of two days on in kind of that high level business planning. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to bring this to uh, the members of Smart Practice. But what instantly happened, which is probably we didn't do a good, I didn't do a good enough job of communicating this to our clients and maybe enrolling them in the idea of how powerful this is for them. But typically, if you can imagine you're an architect and someone tells you, hey, you have an opportunity to plan two days every single month, you're going to be like, heck no, I, I barely have enough time to plan two hours every single month. Uh, it sounds like way too much. And so we started getting just some random feedback like this, like, oh, you know, it wasn't, it's not a requirement, but they're like, oh, two days, who can afford to take two days off of their business, right? And then Ryan, you had a powerful call with them uh, with with some, certain of our clients and tell us how that discussion went and the kind of insights that came out about this because it's going to be applicable to whether you're an employee whether you're running a firm right now uh it, you know we as our you as an architect you you trade in time so like you trade meaning you you sell you buy time this is this is a core business right it so again it was it was very interesting that uh, maybe a little bit of um context so we normally every quarter spend at least one day with our clients planning and you know refining what their plans are what their priorities are for the for the quarter at the end of the year last year we did a two day planning session and from my experience and from my and from you know from with you Enoch and with Nicole and the other people on the team we often find that even the two days is simply not enough yeah, and we also use a special yeah. framework called fact mapping. So during the session, it's not like a normal planning session you might have experienced before. We're using this process of fact mapping. Continue, Ryan. Yeah. So so it's a very it's a very structured kind of two days or a, a period of time, and everyone's planning together. And there's a set of questions and prompts that are given, and you know we go into actually, you know, defining you know, doing an audit of the time that's just passed, how well we achieved on previous goals and targets. Then we start to look at, uh, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Then we'll look at, you know, well, what kinds of, what areas of the business do we need to be focusing on? And then we start setting meaningful goals and targets around that and developing tactics. And then we start scheduling it into calendars and, and diaries and whatnot, so that it's actually there as a planned out process and you know that's easier to, to follow up on the problem with it is even doing it once a quarter very thoroughly like that and having maybe even a weekly a weekly check-in that's only that's very short is that often people either ignore those they disappear and the goals have a tendency just to disperse and 
there is a lot of value of just doing it once a quarter. There's a lot of value doing it once a quarter and perhaps doing a, a little small check-in once a month. But the goals change so much and people, particularly architects, they're so in the weeds of doing the work and are so reactive that the slightest little fire in the business can totally dis derail a plan to an enormous amount. And then they end up end up having to restart or pick up these plans or pick up these goals quarter after quarter after quarter. So that, that was the kind of intention here of spending two days every month doing it. Now, my I had a concern over being two days, not that two days was too much, but I knew that we were going to get pushback from our directly with our clients because they were going to they're in time scarcity. So what do you mean time scarcity? What does that mean? Like, I haven't got enough time. I haven't term. got enough time. I haven't got enough time. There isn't Too enough many things time. to do. Yeah, there's, there's not enough time. We're, we're, we've, we're, there's no way that I can afford to take the time off to do this. Okay, that was the the, the reaction. Okay, that, and so when we launched the initiative and we were telling people it's going to be two days, we had uh, a lot of feedback with people just saying. There's absolutely no way I can afford to take two days out of out of my week, out of my month to do this. Some practices were saying that's a you know, two thirds of our workforce out for two whole days. Other people were were just like, "There's, I can't make that work right now." You know, we've got other things that we need to do. We need to do this, this, and this. Blah blah blah. Okay, so there was a lot of there was a lot of push pushback and. This afternoon, we had to address it in a in a large group that we had, where there was a lot of people together, and it was very interesting because, I ha you know, we had to have a little look at what was the complaint under underlying it. Now we've responded and we've kind of actually reduced the time to meet our clients where they're at more, and you know, don't worry, we'll get we'll, we'll get up to the two out the, the two days in in a in a period of time once everyone's once one day has become normal then we can increase it and i, I appreciate perhaps a you know from a few hours once a month or a, or a day or two a quarter to doing it every month is quite a big jump All right so we've learned from our you know of kind of you know making sure we're meeting with people where, where they're at but it was very insightful to put the question back on to all of our clients why were you freaking out Let's have a look. Okay, so there was a group of about 20 of us this afternoon. The invitation was, let's sit and write down, why did, why did I freak out about the two days? Right? And everyone, had, everyone pretty much admitted when I saw, you know, who put your hand up if, uh, if you freaked out when you saw the two-day invitation every month. Pretty much everyone put their hand up. Boy, let's look at it. Why was I freaking out? And we had people saying things like, well, um, you know, I've got billable work to do. I can't, I can't spend, someone said we're doers and doing this kind of introverted activity is a bit of a waste of time. Um, someone else said, um, you know, right now I really don't have the time to be able to, to be, to be spending on, on planning. Um, there's other things I need to be doing like changing title blocks on spreadsheets. I'm, being silly but it was it was it was more like they were so in the production of the work that, that those are the kinds of blockages that were coming up so everyone kind of wrote down on a piece of paper um what their freak outs were about and then they shared them and we shared them by typing them into one of those kind of chat boxes you get on zoom and everyone read everyone else's things and the next question was like okay well what are the trends that we're all starting to see from where everybody else's complaints were at and it, that was when it started to become quite insightful. And it was like, ah, well, number one, nobody values planning. And that was the first question. Okay, so nobody values planning. Can you, number one, be responsible for how ineffective your planning has been in the past? Okay, so often people have this relationship to planning where they make plans or they make annual goals or they make quarterly goals and they don't accomplish them. And what do they do? They, the reaction is... Well, then planning doesn't work. It's a waste yeah, of time. Brilliant. Yeah, it's not a yeah, good it's, distinction. It's not useful mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. I didn't plan very well or there was something missing in between the points where I planned for why it was ineffective. 
which is exactly yeah. you know what we've done as coaches and as business mentors is that we're recognizing okay there's a there's a there's a piece missing here it's good but it could be a lot better and we want to have we want to hold people's feet to the fire much more consistently and have this kind of discipline of planning really deeply you know part and parcel was this is this is the high value activity in your business okay so planning was deep well the first thing was planning was clearly devalued because I, the evidence would be that most people were ineffective with their planning or it wasn't producing the results that perhaps they had wanted it to or they were planning for goals and they didn't appreciate how much planning and replanning and adapting of plans and strategizing and high level thought and thinking was needed for them to execute on those plans. Okay, so that would be the, the first thing and everyone started to sort of realize, hmm, okay, well that's, that's one thing that we've been doing. A kind of ancillary to that conversation was you realize as a business owner that part of your roles and responsibilities is to plan for strategic growth and profit in the business. Okay? You've started a business, you have a responsibility to ensure its growth trajectory and that you are thinking about it and you're bringing a high level and a high caliber of thinking to the future of the business and you're developing plans and you're speculating about them in the same way that you bring that high caliber thinking to the design of a project and you reiterate the project uh, you know an architectural project you know an architect won't won't have a problem with planning it out and then replanning it and then replanning it and then redrawing it and then going to bed and thinking about it and then waking up again and replanning it and replanning before any brick or piece of metal or concrete is put anywhere near the ground. This thing has gone through this iteration of planning again and again and again. But it seems of it amazes me actually how much of an alien concept this happens to be when we're thinking about planning and designing our own businesses. Even for architects, the master planner, we still have this aversion to the art of of, of planning. So that was the first thing that planning was was grotesquely undervalued, and we've just looked at some of the reasons why it might have been undervalued because of its because of its perceived ineffectiveness, because we're not doing it very well or not enough of it. The second thing that everyone started to realise was that everybody was in complaint about time. Right, and so the two are related. Here is that the most valuable the most valuable thing I can be doing with my time is not planning, but doing work being busy in the business. Now, I know from experience, if we do any extensive detailed audit of what someone's doing with their time, it becomes very amusing because we, we literally go through, all right, let's have a look at what you've done in the last week and let's start putting a dollar amount to how, you know, how much you could have paid someone to do that thing. We'll see CEOs or we'll see practice owners who are doing things like photoshopping fire hydrants out of photographs or they've been changing title blocks or yeah. they've which, been which right which goes into <laughs> the idea of the 20 dollar an hour work 200 dollar an hour work etc mm -hmm. right and this is something that uh very early on in my entrepreneurial journey that i learned from a mentor uh, and it just, a light bulb went off in my head, boom. And when I understood this, my personal income doubled year over year just because I got this one concept. And I was, so just to tell you a little story, there was recently, I was meeting with a heroic firm owner that reached out. Um, and this person, she wanted, she was interested in joining Smart Practice because of the many testimonials and listens to the podcast and and we were having a look at her business and in her business, she's earning uh, about $90,000 a year, which for a sole practitioner in the U.S. is certainly not a lot, but, you know, it's kind of par for the course. And um, just looking at that, like, why wasn't she able to break through? It kind of hovered around there and she'd been doing this for a while, eight years or so, I know, seven to eight years. And, and but this is common. It wasn't it was not an uncommon situation. And as, as I'm talking with her, kind of understanding where her mindset is, she explained, well, you know, when I'm working in the business, I always want to, I always default to doing the architectural work because my mind's saying this is the billable work. Uh, this is the, the, you know, I've got an invoice. This is what pays the bills is doing this kind of work. And so then I asked her, I said, well, have you ever heard of the concept of $20 an hour work, $200 an hour work, $2,000 an hour work, and $20,000 an hour work? I actually even said $200,000 an hour work. And her eyes just like almost exploded out of her head. 
and she's like i have no idea what are you talking about this is i have no idea what you're talking about and it sounds i i'm very skeptical of what what you're saying i said well understandably i said these are just buckets we can look at you know 20 dollar an hour work would be what kind of work it would be things like taking out the trash like ryan was mentioning you know touching up Photoshop files. I mean, you could hire someone off the street to kind of do that, teach them how to use Photoshop and like do that kind of stuff. But filing papers, you know, busy work, cleaning the office, things like this that you might pay someone 20 bucks an hour to be able to do here in the US. Now there's $200 an hour work, which would be the kind of work that an architect would do. It would be everything along with the profession. And and that's kind of where as architects, our minds kind of, they kind of stop there. Like this is the this is the most money, this is the most valuable use of my time is doing the architectural work. And then I asked her, well, what do you think could be what do you think that's two hundred what what do you think could be a two thousand dollar an hour work? And she's just like, I have no idea. I said, Well, what if you're spending time closing a proposal? How much could that work be worth for you? What if you're spending time starting to build a business network? And she's like, oh, the light started to go off. And I said, how about $20,000 an hour work? How much would it be worth it to you to have a lunch meeting with someone? And that person turns into a referral partner that refers you $4 million of work over the next 10 years. And let's say that your profit on that, let's say you, let's say you just get you know $400,000 worth of profit on that over the 10 years. Well, potentially that meeting was a $400,000 lunch meeting. In pure profit, not to mention the money that went into running the firm and things like that. Now, when she understood this, boom, her mind just exploded because then suddenly she realized, she's like, oh, I can see one of the reasons why I'm stuck here and one of the reasons why I don't have any money and one of the reasons why uh, the finances are difficult for me and one of the reasons why I am working so much and one of the reasons why I can't have more leisure in my business is because my time and the way I value my time caps out at my $200 an hour type of work. And so then we go back to planning. Oftentimes, as architects, we don't really... Th Here's the thing. No, none of us went to business school. So none of us learned about the roles in a business that go above and beyond what an architect does. Things like planning, using something like the fact mapping process. So back to you, Ryan. So like when she understood this, she's like, all right, this sounds good. Sign me up. <laughs> I can see that. We're so... So what, what we're talking about here is getting, getting architects and our clients eventually to the point where they can see that spending two days going through a systematic process to plan in your business is going to be one of the most valuable things that you can possibly do in your business. Absolutely. And, and I, I think what's, you know, there is this addiction, if you like, in the industry of it, people find it very difficult to let go of work, very difficult to... Um, enroll or delegate things. Architects particularly, you know, we're trained as specialists and technicians and, you know, we kind of, most people set up a business because they want to become, you know, a well-known architect, if you like, or like they re really want to do the best caliber kind of work. And usually that idea of doing the best kind of work means, well, I've got to have my hand on everything because... I know how good I am and I need to make sure that it's got my, my stamp on it. And, and also the, the kind of lumped in with that is that architecture for many people is incredibly satisfying and they can get a little bit confused with, you know, the, you know, being satisfied with, with something and then also getting in the way of an other project and then making the whole business not very fulfilling. Um, and so I'll see a lot of architects really wrestling with, not wanting to let go of work because they believe either in the moment it's quicker if I just do it now rather than giving it to somebody else to do it. Nobody else can do it as well as I can. So it makes more sense for me to do it. But that also, that's really interesting because this is where we see people end up, you know, photoshopping fire hydrants out of photographs or tweaking something that really doesn't need to be tweaked by you i mean i know i've done this before myself with photographs where i just i just let me just because no one else can crop it the way i can crop it and they won't get it quite right and if i see it just done a little bit wrong it's going to irk me or irritate me okay but that's the that's the kind of compulsive nature of like 
of of architecture that gets in the way of us actually running it as a as a business and empowering somebody else to do it. And so I invite everybody as an who as an architect to consider that part of your architectural journey or evolution is to learn how to design and execute through other people. And this is the key. And yeah. So the promise we made at the beginning of the podcast was you'll learn how to double, triple, or quadruple, or even 10x your effectiveness. It's not by you working harder, which is a great news. It's actually not by you working harder. It's actually by you working less, but overcoming this challenge of actually being able to delegate and then really valuing the importance of the very high, high value activities in your business, like marketing, sales, and planning. Yeah. So, so, you know, we often say in a, for a partner in a business, there's three domains that they've got to be competent in. One is winning work. The other is doing the work, which is normally don't have to worry about, worry about that one. And the third is supporting the work. And the winning the work is what we're talking about is the marketing and the sales, negotiating, building up a network of, of people. Um, and that can be enormously profitable. But even within that, that domain, there is high value work and there's low value work. High value work would be prospecting, reaching out to somebody, having that lunch, negotiating a contract. Low value work might be you posting something on Instagram or um, writing uh, a kind of, you know, the back page of the brochure that you've just done or photoshopping yeah. the high fire hydrants or the, you know, the, the, the fire hydrants out of the photographs. Okay. That right. So be, with that, with that, with like, for instance, like with negotiating, like, like just understanding that if an architect were to negotiate an extra $20,000 on a job, or let's say an extra $5,000 on a job, that negotiation might take all of 10 minutes. That's $5,000 made in those 10 minutes. Mm hmm. Okay, and once your mind begins to think this way, once your mind thinks not in terms of architectural billing rates and, and just doing the work, but actually thinks in terms of the value of your time, everything begins to change. It, Business gets a lot easier and funner. It's, it, it's fun. extraordinary. I remember um, I was negotiating. So when I first learned the, the sales method that we did teach here at Business of Architecture, um, you know, I, I wasn't using a proposal, wasn't sitting down and writing something out. I was going into a meeting and I had an idea in my head what I was going to charge somebody. And I remember in the conversation, you know, we do a thing called pit to peak where we're finding a lot of pains with somebody, bringing them into what we call the pit and then helping them establish a vision for the future, which is the peak. You do that well, you can really sense attention. And I remember in this particular conversation, I had an idea in my head of what I was going to charge them for the project. And maybe it was 10, 10,000 pounds, let's just say, for, for the purposes of this conversation. Um, and I, and I remember finding a lot of pain and they were getting quite emotional about it. And, I, you know, and they were also trusting me and they were sharing a lot of intimate details about this project. And the scope of the, it wasn't necessarily the scope of the project, but the importance of what this project meant to them. And I was like, ah, there's like, there's, there's more money here on the, on the table. More for value. This, there's more value, right? There's more In value. Both directions. Yeah. There's, there's, there's like, you know, this is going to need more attention and it's more important to them. So the, the figure that I had in my head went up. And there was more, it was more value. And of course at that time, and I remember thinking that and I, and I, you know, negotiated the price and they were like happy with it and we shook hands and I was like, wow, that little bit of, just because we had that effective, uh, an effective conversation there, that I just made a few, um, you know, however many thousand pounds I added on to the, to the, to the value of the investment. Yeah, let's face it, you're a happier architect now. You're making more money. You're more likely to, you know, feel good and not resentful for the services you're providing. Yeah. It's a win -win. Absolutely. So the, that that, you know, learning to negotiate and the the kind of negotiation skills when you're able to help and identify more deeply problems can make us a lot of money. Exactly. And the weird thing about negotiation is like usually we're negotiating against ourselves, which is what happened in that situation with you, wasn't it, Ryan? Where the yeah. actual negotiation was all between your ears. Absolutely. And how many of us know that we've been in that situation before? You know, should I charge this? Oh, but they won't accept it. Should I charge this? But we're the ones who are in charge of bringing home 
the buffalo, so to speak, the bacon for uh, for the for the team members for the firm to make that value exchange happen. All right, so there we go. There's our episode today. We talked about time scarcity, which if you're an architect is definitely not um, not uncommon. It's a very it's easy to feel very overwhelmed and like there's a lack of time. But one of the critical shifts is to actually reframe our minds and actually really have a true and correct understanding of the value of time. Only when we do that can then our results start to dramatically improve. Fantastic. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.